Welcome to Dear Sandy. I'm Sandy Galef, a member of the New York State Assembly representing parts of Northern Westchester and parts of Putnam County. And tonight we're going to be talking about a very uh, interesting and important topic. Uh, it's Sing Sing. And uh, there is a Sing Sing prison in Osnane, and there is an effort underway to have a Sing Sing Museum to talk about the whole history of uh, Sing Sing over a period of time from the uh, early 1800s on. And I have as my guest a very special person that has a, a wonderful relationship with Sing Sing, a constituent of mine. And Lithgow Osborne is from uh, Garrison, and I'm so glad to have you here. You are the board member of the Osborne Association. Yes. And, you know, when, when I'm thinking, looking back at, at your family history, it's been so interesting because your family's been so involved in reform efforts, whether mm. being abolitionists, uh, the early women's movement, right, yeah. and then, uh, and we're going to be concentrating, I believe, on your great-grandfather yes. who is into uh, looking at the way we conducted prisons and what needed to be done, the reforms in that area, and so I just think it's uh, very special that you're here today. Thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Right. Well, when you started, you know, it's it's so interesting. And people always say to me, well, how do you get involved in, in, in different issues? Um, you know, how do you know what your constituents are thinking? And I'm, I'm thinking about you, Lithgow, because uh, we met at several events. Mm. And um, you, you would come up with me to me and talk about different issues. Yes. And one of them, um, you know, you were kind of curious, I think, about what are those people in Austin doing right. about <laughs> Sing Sing? And, uh, you know, for the last, I'd say, five or six years, yeah. we've been having discussions about how we could put together a, a museum um, that would be um, a very significant for the Hudson Valley and sure. kind of relate to West Point and Kaikut and the Sleepy Hollow area, the, mm. the history of our, of our community, and Sing Sing is really just a part of it. Yeah. And, uh, and I frankly, I, didn't, I really didn't know about your background, so right. tell me about your great-grandfather. What was his name? Oh, his name was Thomas Mott Osborne. And he was the son of the founder of something called Osborne Harvesting. And so he grew up fairly affluent. Um, but his ancestors were all Quakers. And one of his forebears was Lucretia Mott, of course, who was one of the uh, prime movers and shakers in the women's rights movement, but also an early abolitionist. Um, so he came by his interest in penal reform Honestly, it wasn't something where he had a white, you know, shining moment one day and, you know, decided to devote himself to him, himself to um, uh, prison reform. It was a it was an honest kind of manifestation of feelings that he already had. You know, that we could do better. We can always do better. Um, how did he get to think about that? I mean, it's not like everybody, um, you know, it's not like a lot of people are sitting around <laughs> right. thinking about, well, how, how can we make this a better system and make sure that people don't go to prison in the first right. place, and when they're there, well, how can we rehabilitate them? It's interesting because he grew up in Auburn, and of course Auburn has a maximum security mm. prison dead in the center of it. You, when you got off the train at Auburn, you got uh, across the, um, you know, across the street, there was Auburn Prison. And if you've ever been to Auburn Prison, it's very imposing and it's very big, you know, it's like Sing Sing, it's a you know, big gray behemoth. And as a child, he used to have nightmares about an escaped convict. Very serious, disturbing nightmares. And when he went away to school, he, stopped having them, but when he came home on one of his vacations, he decided that he would take a tour of Auburn Prison because he'd never done it before. And he was completely terrified because it brought up all those old memories, but when he walked through the prison, it changed him. He said he thought we can do better. We can definitely do better because at the time, there was a silence rule. You could not speak. Now, what, what years are we talking about? Um, 
Well, let's see. He first went to, I, I'll say he first went into the prison at about 1900 mm -hmm. to, to visit. And, um, but he was uh, occupied with a number of other um, uh, institutions, um, the George Junior Republic, which, um, it, which was sort of a boys town type um, organization that helped, you know, unruly and wild boys and helped to, to rehabilitate them. And so adult prisons kind of became an adult reformation, sort of was the next level up from that. And he got appointed to the um, Commission on Prison Reform, um, the, gov the then governor whose name escapes me, but um, I'm sure he was a good governor, um, appointed him. And the commission decided. Well, why did he, why did the governor appoint your grandfather just because he was talking about reform and he yes. thought, you know and what, he, maybe this is pr uh, somebody that's really going to do this? Well, he had the time and um, the energy. Mm -hmm. And he was also very vocal about it. So what do you do with somebody who has time, energy, and is very vocal about it? Put a him to work. Yeah, right. put him to work. Right. So we put him on the commission. And of course, mm -hmm. he was a, um, a, a can-do kind of guy. You know, he always just, you know, get in, okay, we're going to do this and this and this. But the down, you know, his, the, I think his Achilles heel was the fact that if he held an opinion and you disagreed with him, then it didn't matter. He, wa he would not be swayed. If he held a belief, he held a belief. And um, you couldn't convince him otherwise. So that's good, but it's also uh, can be a little hard to live with, I'm sure. Right, <laughs> right. So when he, um, I mean, I, you have some interesting tales about how he learned more about prisons. I, th I think right. just, um, you know, he, he really went and, and, and I'm thinking about it because actually I've been in Sing Sing. Um, yeah. I don't think I've been, I, I've been at the Westchester County uh, Jail and, and the Putnam County Jail, but mm. other than that, and I, I must say whenever I go to Sing Sing, uh, I, it's just so hard to know mm. these little tiny cells. Uh, people don't realize what a terrible situation people are in. I think if they, if they could, think about it ahead of time, they would decide not to do whatever it mm. is to get them there yeah. in the first place because uh, it, it's not a, n not a, a nice place to, to live particularly. But, um, and I know that there were some, there was a, there was a writer a number of years ago who, who actually took a course uh, or, or signed up to be a correction officer. Right. And um, because he, he was a reporter, wanted to know more about the prison exactly. system. Exactly. But I think your great grandfather did a lot of that, like behind the scenes, well, uh, it, look, it, checking things out. Well, he decided that um, with the commission, um, he just they the, the, the they as a group decided that the best way to understand the conditions of the prison and not have it filtered through the superintendent or the guards mm -hmm. was to actually be in the prison. Mm -hmm. So he voluntarily incarcerated himself in Auburn prison for a week um, under the name of Tom Brown, um, inmate number 33,333X. And that Is was... That, that's how many prisoners had been there over the time? Did they I keep adding up or <laughs> whatever I don't know how they was. came up with that number, <laughs> but I tell you what, it makes it very easy to remember. <laughs> Um, but he uh, voluntarily incarcerated himself, and but the the thing was is that he gave he went in on Monday, but on Sunday he gave a chapel talk and told the men that he was coming in, mm -hmm. and that he was going to be with them for the week, and that he didn't want to be treated any differently or have any experiences that that weren't authentic and real, and wanted to f try to fit in as much as a six foot four. Patrician could fit into a um, that s setting, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, he w even went so far as to shave off his mustache, which mm -hmm. I don't know. Probably having a mustache during that time, maybe. Um, <laughs> but the curious thing is that I figured out just recently is that he's the same age I am today. 
-hmm. And I can tell you that there is no way I would voluntarily incarcerate myself in any prison. Mm -hmm. um, the conditions are, um, they're, they're, they're still horrendous. They're still um, um, bone crushingly uh, inhuman uh, to, many, to, to a real extent. But he learned um, what the conditions were at the time. Mm -hmm. And he also became friends with a lot of the men in Auburn prison. And they, of course, were very suspicious of him because mm -hmm. who is this guy coming in and da da da. Mm -hmm. But once they got to know him, they really began to like him and trust him. Because mm -hmm. he, was, he, was, um, he was able to talk with pretty much anybody. And so he probably, uh, they probably told him a lot of stories about yes, what was going on. Exactly. They were very open with him. And also the, he, he witnessed for himself because there's, there are a lot of things that, you know, okay, th there are uh, always systems that are um, going to be flawed and uh, the penal system is no different. Uh, but there are always going to be people who do bad things within those mm -hmm. systems. But not everybody does bad. You know, it's not all bad. There, not every single person in that prison system is bad. And um, there are um, attitudes and um, uh, ways of doing things that are so ordinary to the people who live there that an outsider would see them and say, that's terrible. Why are they doing it that way? That's so mm -hmm. inhuman. That's dehumanizing. And of course, the prisoners and the guards take it for fact. You know, that's the way it is. They don't know any, in a mm -hmm. way, they, mm -hmm. that's how it's always been. And he proposed a different way to approach. So did he end up going to the governor at the time after that? Or, he, or how did he get his ideas and how did he get to Sing Sing? Well, he... <laughs> interesting thing is is that he came out of Auburn prison uh, very changed I can mm -hmm. tell you and um, he wrote a book called Within Prison Walls which um, was self-published um, but then he picked up I think Lippincott picked it up and um, it, it was essentially a diary of his experience and he began to um, advocate with the governor and um, do the work of the penal commission, uh, the reform commission, and, um, and just lecture. He spent the better part of his life lecturing anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. anybody who would have him, he would go and lecture. Um, and uh, my grandfather once told me that it was a rare occasion that <laughs> his father was home for dinner. Mm -hmm. um, I, and. He said that with all due respect. I mean, he, did, he, he said it with no bitterness because he admired his father. Mm -hmm. And um, as I admire my great-grandfather, he's a very tough character to live up to, I must say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a statue of him in um, Auburn, where I mm -hmm. grew up, um, uh, that is in front of the, um, the police station. And, um, it's a statue of my great-grandfather, and he is, uh, it's bigger than life, I can tell you, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he's, hand, he's standing there in a posture of, he has the manacles in one hand at his side, oh. and he has his other hand out, um, stretched out with the Book of Life, because mm -hmm. it actually mm -hmm. says the Book of Life on the sculpture. You and mm -hmm. I would never see it. The only way I know that is because I've, um, I've seen, you know, I've been up there mm -hmm, to see mm -hmm. it, but it's, um, it says the Book of Life, mm -hmm. and, and surrounded, and this is the best part of the, sculpt, of the sculpture itself, is a uh, sort of a bas-relief of all the men, the convicts, oh, sort of gathered right. around the base, and um, sort of in attitudes of despair and hope and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, nonchalance and, you know, 
fear and you know kind of every expression of a prisoner's life mm -hmm. and it's it's a fascinating sculpture i believe that austening has a copy we can't oh we we have had a hard time we we're we we're trying to see if we could find something and right. just really felt that maybe it was just up in auburn but i i don't know mm -hmm. you know and and one of the reasons um lithgow is that we're talking about this is that when we have a Sing Sing Museum, yes. we, we're going to be able to incorporate so much of what you've said, right. and s I, I know we have some artifacts and pictures yeah. and things like that that you've brought, that we'll be able to, to have them right. as a part of a, uh, a living history right. of the whole penal system yes. and how it worked. So your great-grandfather came to Sing Sing that was uh, 1913, like 1913 he went in okay. and so this year will be the uh, this year coming up will be, be the, the hundredth years. anniversary of that um, mm -hmm. so this is very auspicious mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. um, for my um, for the Osborne Association um, w you know and we carry on his work um, mm -hmm. and my family and for me in particular because I feel honored to um, to to be here with you and to speak of his work, um, because I will tell anybody the story that at the drop of a hat. And some people are a little bored with it, but I mm -hmm. frankly never get tired of telling it. Um, because he believed that prisons should not be scrap heaps, that they should be machine shops, that they should be about reform. Mm -hmm. You have a literally a captive audience. You do, absolutely. And you can take advantage of that or not. Mm -hmm. Because as you and I both know, it's a, it, I, think, I think the figure is about 95% of those men are going home. And how mm -hmm. do you want them? How do you want them coming back to the neighborhoods, to, the, to, to, um, to their families? And we know that keeping families connected to prisoners is one of the surest ways to, to, to solidify their return to, the na to, their, to their homes, it's keeping them connected. Mm -hmm. Because you can still be a parent and be in prison. It's not impossible. Um, lately, um, we, we, uh, we have parenting programs that we teach in the various prisons around New York State. But one of the great advantages of the modern age is Skype. Mm -hmm. And we've mm -hmm. now started doing um, teleconferencing with parents and children. And I have to tell you that has been, that is such an exciting idea that, you know, you know, a young boy, young girl can get on the computer and Skype with their parent who's in, who's, or not even just their parent, their brother, their sister, their grandfather, you know, s whomever. Um, and it, it's, it doesn't take the place of human connection, but it does form a connection. It does. So you're working on that today. Was yeah. your great grandfather working on it back then? Was that? One of um, his well, he felt issues. that, um, oh, most definitely, that um, if you gave a man um, an opportunity to do the right thing, that he would do it. So therefore, education was important, mm -hmm. making sure that they were literate, um, giving them a vocation. He started vocational training. In, um, he advocated for vocational training. Had that been happening before it? Well, you know, what's, really. in, what's interesting about the history of, of, of how we treat prisoners is we, we kind of come and go with different mm. ideas. So, you know, you might have vocational training and then you drop it and yeah. then you put it back in again. Mm. So you're saying that you probably don't think that much had happened before your great-grandfather came along well, in that area. Well, um, to tell you the truth, I don't really know, but I, I do know that um, there, there was a machine shop, a, a woodworking shop that mm -hmm. was um, mm -hmm. that's still in Auburn Prison, and I don't know um, the last time I was there. And it's called the Tom Brown Woodworking Shop oh, okay. after my great grandfather. Right, his alias. Yeah, his alias. Yes, right. um, and um, the, growing up, we had a suite of furniture that was prison-made furniture, mm -hmm. and it was mm -hmm. very sort of beautiful extremely well made, mm -hmm. uh, over-decorated, I might add, mm -hmm. but 
beautiful nonetheless. We still, actually, we still do, uh, there are some prisons that do, still do the word working. Yes. Uh, because we will have every once in a while up in Albany, um, in, in the legislative office building, there'll be some, um, you know, display and, mm -hmm. and showing what the prisoners are working on. And, but also there's, um, there are a number of uh, programs on Rikers, in, for instance, that, um, that are centered around organic gardening. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We have some programs called, one program in particular called Fresh Start, which helps to teach culinary skills to, um, to some of the younger inmates there um, as a way to give them, you know, an opportunity once they get off, you know, once they get out of um, prison, that they actually have something to, mm -hmm. uh, they have a skill. Well, so. well, that's the basic part of it all is to either through education and vocational right. uh, to be able to have those skills so that when, when you do get out of prison, and you're yeah. right, the majority of people do at some yeah. point, and that you're better prepared uh, for society. So what did your grandfather think about? Um, did he do any other aliases inside of Sing Sing at all? <laughs> um, well, he did actually. Um, uh, he uh, w was in Auburn prison, and then prior to becoming um, the warden at Sing Sing in 1914, mm -hmm. he did spend a week at Sing Sing. Um, uh, and the guards <laughs> were absolutely horrified that this guy, who was going to uh -huh. be the warden, right. was going to come and stay for a week. Mm -hmm. living in the prison. Right. Did he uh, live in, in one of the cells? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. And they just were flummoxed. They, mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. they were afraid for his life, and they were certain that he would get shanked, and, you know, that there would be, you know, this was going to be a real mess. And nothing happened to him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, he, men would come up to him. He, he would walk around the yard unescorted, you know, no... Um, you know, no bodyguards, no nothing, and he would just talk to the men, and the men would talk to him, and, you know, and they developed a very easy rapport, because, he, mm -hmm. as I say, he was a very easy person to talk to. Once you sort of got over the fact that he was six foot four and had the most impeccably beautiful manners ever, mm -hmm. and he had a very deep voice, and um, so uh, once you got past that part and found that he was genuinely interested in what you had to say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the men found it very easy mm -hmm. to to warm up to him, and um, so he wasn't there a real long time. I don't think. No. But, um, uh, but he w but he was able. He felt satisfied that he was able to make some positive changes there. Or well, I think that his point. experience at Sing Sing. Uh, I think he was grateful to have the opportunity to be there, but ultimately it was not a happy experience because. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of um, people who um, started working against him, and he was charged with many, you know, sort of all kinds of scandalous things. And he actually was indicted and, mm -hmm. um, here in Westchester, um, but eventually the charges were dropped. I mean, they came up with all manner of, you know, um, acts of. Um, uh, you know, they said that he, that he was fraternizing with the, with, um, the prisoners and that he had mm -hmm. taken, you know, that he was paying out money and taking money and, you mm -hmm. know. So a lot of, a lot of a setup. It, yeah, and right. a, lot of a lot of it was politically motivated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, I'm sure. Now, you brought a lot of different things here. Yep. Um, I, let's, I, let's see um, if, if there's some that you'd like to just yeah, uh, I, in the uh, last few minutes Some here. of the things that I, I brought here um, are... Amazingly enough, while he was in, when he was at Sing Sing, he started something called the Mutual Welfare League, mm -hmm. which was a self-governed um, um, prison organization. And the men uh, elected their own, um, you know, board of overseers, and they had their own currency, and they had their own baseball team, they had their own mm -hmm. theatrical troupe. Mm -hmm. And th a number of the things that I have here, um, and I'm, I'm not going to bother with a lot of this stuff because it's not terribly interesting. I mean, it is interesting, but we don't really have time. This here is a, um, it's a Sing Sing, a souvenir of Sing Sing 1917, and it's an example of penmanship. 
Oh, beautiful yeah. penmanship. And very beautiful right. penmanship. And we have the Mutual Welfare League logo there. Um, then, then I also have sports programs for the baseball teams. Mm -hmm. And these were traveling baseball teams, by the way. So these are prisoner baseball yes. teams that played. I, I know Babe Ruth at some point yes. played at Sing Sing. So, yes. um, you know, that they had a team that, that went with professionals exactly. too. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And, the, and, right. The, and, and the, the, the professional teams would come and play, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sort of, it, w it was sort of good fun all around. I mean, because mm -hmm, I don't, mm -hmm. um, but they played competitively against other teams. The, um, <coughs> I, I know the Negro Leagues also came into the mm -hmm. prisons and did it. This is a uh, postcard that shows the uh, Mutual Welfare League currency. Maybe tip it a little bit. Tip I don't know whether um, that and works or not. But, yeah. <laughs> but it's um, dollars and coins, and which mm -hmm. is kind of fascinating that they have their own currency. Well, actually, I was at the New York Muse Historical Museum, mm -hmm. um, and we found out that they have some currency that was used oh. at Sing Sing. Um, so, you know, I think what we're trying to do is is you know look at all this memorabilia, right. and it could be a part of um, well, I, demonstrations and I, exhibits there. I tell you, I feel very strongly about the museum, and you and I have talked mm -hmm. about this, and I think that the idea of the um, a museum of Sing Sing. Um, it struck me at first as maybe um, it could go uh, be a little bit lurid and you know kind of um, not such a great idea. But after talking with you and really mm. expressing my concerns that it be done in a serious historical fashion, um, I I'm fully prepared to donate my collection to the museum when it becomes a reality because mm -hmm. I feel his legacy and the legacy of, but, and the history of penal mm -hmm. reform in New York State and the history of Sing Sing, it's important that we um, present that in a um, scholarly, uh, historical fashion so that when people come to visit, they understand right, the importance. Right, what happened? We're almost at the end, okay. let's go, but you brought something else oh, here, yes. which the, w b just very, very quickly, yeah. why don't you show us what the bad side, this I is think the it's bad the bad side. side. This right. is the really the worst of it, let me say. It was this uh, type of treatment that my great-grandfather was most shocked by. This is a head cage mm -hmm. that the prisoners would wear when they were being transported. Uh, in addition to being shackled with their and It's very feet. heavy. It's, it's yeah, iron. Yeah, very heavy. And they would put around the head and then it would be padlocked in the front. And I have a photograph here, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see it because of the glare, but you tell me, that um, of a picture of my great-grandfather in this mm -hmm. headgear. Mm -hmm. um, because I will tell you that he was, it was not beneath him to do a theatrical gesture in order to make a point. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why it's part of the reason why I love him so much is because mm -hmm. he was, you know, he, he really was out there and he was committed and he, um, he was on the side of the angels. And it's an honor to be here and it's an honor to carry on his work. And I, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I pale well, in that's, comparison. That's what we're trying to do, Lithgow. And we have, you know, we've been working for a while. We, we actually have um, produced some uh, books about yes. what the museum would be like. Um, you know, we're up the river. That's right. that's what we're thought of as yep. many places. Um, it's where the expression comes from, actually. Right. And, um, you know, what we're looking at right now, there had been an old cell block, but um, that had been yeah. uh, on fire, and it's not really, there's not much there, and no. it's a little um, little compromised. But we're, we're looking at the powerhouse that is there and being able to use it. It's just right outside. It's, yeah. it's near it, but it's right outside. And, um, you know, being able to d talk about the, the history of reform and your great-grandfather. But so. also to talk about the men and women who worked in the prison mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm. I hope their story is going to be told too because their story is it runs concurrently with the prisoners mm -hmm. and um, right. with reform. Right. We will we will do that. I just want to thank you so much thank you for so being much. here I and really appreciate telling it. about your, your great grandfather and your family. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all of you watching the program. If you'd like to be involved in uh, what we can, what we're going to create in the future, the Sing Sing Museum, 
please give me a call or you want to talk to Lithgow a little bit more about uh, what he has, uh, give me a call at 914-941-1111. Uh,